Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace, an all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website and now an online store. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TWIST. And by Wistia, Take control of your video marketing with powerful tools and analytics built specifically for business. Go to wistia.com slash twist and get your free Wistia account today. And by Amazon Web Services, it's easy to get started with AWS Activate, a new global program for startups with AWS credits, training, developer support, a startup community forum, and more. Visit aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Today on the program, Academia is with me. It's a startup that's raised close to $20 million to try to make academic research and, by extension, cures for diseases happen a lot faster and a lot more uh, efficiently. Stick with us. It's going to be an amazing episode. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. How it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money Spend the money and defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money Spend the money and defeat you Ah yes, hey everybody, hey everybody I'm, I'm just gonna take a sip of my tea anyways you guys didn't hear that on the uh, recording, did you? Um, this is This Week in Startups. This is the program where we talk about technology, how it's impacting society, uh, investing in companies, all that stuff. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. If it's your first time here, I don't know where the hell you've been. I've been doing this for five freaking years. Uh, anyway, you can follow me on Twitter at Jason. You can follow the show at TWI Startups, This Week in Startups, and you can find us on the web at thisweekinstartups.com. Uh, on this program, like I said, we, we talk about disrupting and innovating, and today uh, we have a great entrepreneur, Richard Price, on the program, who is running academia.edu, uh, and you can go um, take a look at that. Now, uh, Richard, $20 million you've raised for this, academia.edu, yeah. what are you trying to do? What are you trying to change in the world here? So we're trying to build a new system for scientists to share their papers in a much faster and more open way. So the current way a scientist shares their paper is that they do some experiments, they write a paper, they send the paper to a journal, the journal sends it to a, two or three peer reviewers who peer review it, meaning they write a page of comments on the paper and they recommend either accepting the paper or rejecting the paper. Normally you get a few rejections and you have to apply to journals in sequence, not parallel. So each iteration cycle takes about three months. So it all mm. adds up to around 12 month time lag between finishing the paper and it coming out in some journal or other, maybe your fourth choice. And how long would somebody take to write one of these academic papers? Because people hear about academic papers and you know a lot of people who listen to the program went to college or whatever, but they never got to that point at which they were graduate students or PhDs or professors writing papers. What is the point of a paper exactly? Like, where did this come from, this whole concept? Yeah, this whole concept came from the idea, like, in the 1600s when, before that, like, science was this sort of gentlemanly pursuit of rich men um, who had enough resources to pursue their own hobbies. Science was a hobby. And then Newton came along and the scientific revolution came along. And the premise there was people shouldn't be duplicating each other's work. Um, the first journal was invented, and the idea was you submit your results and you provide a public good to other scientists in Europe and the rest of the world who could then build on your results. And Newton said, you know, I have stood on the shoulders of giants, and that was the core concept of publishing. Now, is there something broken about the current system other than it's incredibly slow? I mean, is it slow, and that results in, you know, this process being... Um, having a lot of validity, and is it slow in a good way, or is it too slow? I think slowness is definitely one thing. Yeah. So um, if you're, say, a Parkinson's researcher working on Parkinson's, yeah. and you come up with this, you might come up with a paper that's kind of part of the jigsaw puzzle. It's not a cure for Parkinson's, but it might be a cure for, it might be the sort of piece that fits into someone else's cure. If your paper's delayed by 12 months, it means that their paper's also delayed ah, by 12 months. So you months. have a queuing problem. There's a knock-on effect, yeah. I think there's also um, a problem about open access. So that's another issue. When it is published, um, it's behind a paywall, which costs $35 to get past. And Why is that? Because wasn't this what Aaron Schwartz was doing when he got yeah. Aaron Schwartz, the, the hacker who uh, tragically killed himself uh, under um, being 
persecuted for like or prosecuted for like this incredible amount of crimes like that's right a decade yeah. in jail all he was doing was stealing academic stealing i'm doing air quotes here for people who are listening on the audio he was downloading in mass all these papers yeah that's right yeah from this academic site called jstor and i mean i think a lot of people have become very activist around this idea of open access because they right. feel that um scientific literature is a public good and that everyone around the world should is. have access to it and you know, you have geneticists and people working malaria in Africa, for instance, who actually cannot have, don't can't afford access to the malaria literature. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Is there one gatekeeper? Is it? Is it? Just there are Jason three or? main companies that are the publishers, and the fact of the matter is that it's very expensive for them to actually publish papers. I mean, mm. they get the papers and the peer reviews for free. And the expense comes in other ways. They have very inefficient processes whereby, like, they employ l the whole infrastructure, you know, like, underpinned by a layer of human beings uh -huh. who are employed to match papers with peer reviewers. That's kind of, it costs ah, around, like, So that's what they're doing, actually. They're not just publishing them and storing them. They're saying these are the people who should be reviewing them. That's right, yeah. Oh, so that is a great service that they're providing. It is a good service, yeah, yeah. So they choose those two or three peer reviewers, and they have human beings involved in the sort of matching process. And the best way they can figure out to make a living is to get paid thirty-five dollars to download a yeah. paper. Yeah. Or alternatively, the author can pay four thousand bucks to sort of basically defray the cost of publication. Oh, and so then, some people just say, "Here's four dimes." That means four thousand dollars, by the way. If you don't yeah. gamble like I do, but you can pay four dimes and just basically yeah. make it open to everybody. Make it open I can to unlock everyone. the paywall as it was. And four thousand is it's raised basically around like two thousand bucks for the matching process of finding uh -huh. peer reviews and two thousand bucks for hand formatting each PDF. So each PDF is hand formatted, and that's part of also the inefficiency. Do you think all well, they should just go away, like it just be free, and then there's some other model that they could pursue, or is that My what you're doing in that, academia? Yeah, I mean, I think that when you finish writing a paper, you should post it immediately on the internet. Hmm. I think do people do that or no? They do that right now, yeah. Um, and in fact, they do that on academia.eu. Yeah. Um, it's one of the use cases. I think a second aspect is peer review should happen post-publication rather mm -hmm. than pre-publication. And it should be done sort of Reddit style, more huh. of a community model than just two or three people. Huh. I think it's going to be more robust with a community model, dissecting the paper line by line. And why why did it never come, oh, like Rap Genius almost? Yeah, kind of Highlighting like, it and being yeah, like... Yeah, with real scholars, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is what it means yeah. when he's dropping dimes. This is what it means, yeah. Obviously. I gather Ben Horowitz came up with the term scholar for Rap Genius. Like, everyone's a scholar on Rap Genius. Uh, oh, really? The yeah. idea is to have real, you know, like... I think especially for, like, papers that are getting a lot of attention, you want a peer review system that doesn't just have two or three people scrutinizing the claims, but it's being scrutinized by thousands of people line by line saying, you know, like, just tearing the paper apart. That's kind of a sort of level of robustness I think I'd like to see. And would, what would that do if you had, if that existed in the world, if all of these papers were open in your estimation and right. all of them were ripped apart, you know, and savaged by a thousand people Reddit yeah. style? Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty crazy thought would that make yeah. the people who write the papers less likely to likely to publish them because they would be so scared that they were going to look stupid or would they be glad to have more eyes on it i mean what, what does an average researcher want more eyes on it or less criticism what they want is the thing that the mantra they care most about is this a publish or perish mantra mm. and what that comes down to is how is my work going to be evaluated by the hiring committee and the grant committee because you're everyone's in this rat race in science it's hyper competitive mm. because getting a grant from the nih which is the main grant provider of mm. biomedical funding is you, you have like a 10 percent success rate for your application so right. it's very competitive and you're always thinking how can i present my work in the most impactful light to really ah. knock the socks off so the, they're trying to basically seo and social media optimize their papers now that's actually part of why they will take you know come to a site like academia you as they feel that like anything that can anything that can move the needle so they're just like journalists today like in a way like the journalists are trying to get attention so they're writing like sexier headlines or leads is that actually like on a lesser extent or in a less let's say a gruesome extent happening in academic papers where people are like i need a sexy headline i need a you know i need an editorial hook for my paper um, I think that is definitely something to that in the sense that like the metrics you're evaluated for are ones you optimize for. So what if you right now? Right. You so know, what are the metrics? Right now, it's well historically it's always been this idea of like how prestigious the journal is that you're published in. Ah, got it. Sure. And it's not really an impact metric. It's more like getting published in Nature is more like a prediction of impact. Mm -hmm. And then they also care about how many citations they have. Right. The citations is a big people thing. linking to them. So you do get kind of any you, you people get start optimizing for how do i get in nature how do i get citations 
And the and goal how do you get in them? You, there's a there's an editorial board at those publications that has to think, hey, this is pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that. Where is it that they think people want to read this? So, firstly, the peer reviewers have to okay it. Yeah. And then once the sort of the paper's been sort of checked out for kind of validity and inter interestingness by the experts, the editors mm -hmm. will say, well, does it fit in with nature's philosophy? Hmm. All right. When we get back from a uh, commercial break, I want you to tell me about the possible, well, what you were doing with academia to sort of solve these problems. And then also, I want to talk about crowdfunding and like research, if that sort of has made its way into academia um, and academic papers when we get back on This Week in Startups. Hey, thanks so much to my friends at Squarespace uh, for making a great content management system for us here at the launch company. We use it for everything we do. We love it. It's just a fabulous product. And Squarespace, you probably know many people in your life who are using it, and their lives are made easy. 24-hour support, it's easy, and they're constantly improving. Uh, I've shown you guys the commerce stuff. I've shown you the fluid websites where if it works on mobile or the iPad or the desktop, it all looks great and you don't have to do anything extra. You don't have to spend any extra money. Just such a great company. And if you go and try it, it's uh, no credit card required. So just go to squarespace.com. Starts at only $8 a month, but again, you can try it with no credit card. And if you decide to keep it, just use the promo code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, T-W-I-S-T. A better st web starts with your website. That's right. Let's take back the web and make it super clean and gorgeous using Squarespace. And hey, if you want to work at a company that's actually doing, you know, great stuff to help the web and... Um, Squarespace is a great place to work. Let me tell you, I've been there. 30 developers and designers are being hired by March 15th. They're doing a hiring rush, and they want you to be part of it. So go to uh, be a profit, be a part of it, be a part of it, be a part of it, dot squarespace.com. Be a part of it, dot squarespace.com. Um, and if you're from outside uh, New York, treat yourself and your spouse to a weekend in New York by coming and... Uh, you know, interviewing over there. They do a great job. It's a great team. We use the product. We love the product. You will too. Go to squarespace.com and sign up. Use the promo code TWIST. And uh, just thanks so much to the team over there for making a great product and supporting This Week in Startups for so long. Let's get back to this interview. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. You're listening to This Week in Startups. You can find us on the web, thisweekinstartups.com, or on the Twitter, TWI Startups. I'm at Jason. My guest today, Richard Price, who is the uh, co-founder. I got to get that right all the time, right? You got a co-founder or two? Um, or are you just the founder? I, I'm, I, I founded it myself. Oh, okay. So solo founder. I always got to yeah. be careful because if I say you're a founder and you're a co-founder, I'm going to get an email from somebody who's going to say, oh my God. Yeah. When I left Oxford, I, uh, did, I did a PhD at Oxford and then just founded it after, after leaving Oxford. Great. Um, and uh, he, Richard is the CEO of academia.org. Edu, you can go check that out. Academia.edu. All right, so we've been talking about um, the crazy world of publishing papers. Four thousand dollars to get yourself exposed to the world, paying people to get the peer review, optimizing to get into nature or whatever it is. Um, you looked at all this and said, "Hey, man, it's got to be a better way." And you started building a website, like uh, entrepreneurs are uh, often uh, inclined to do. What what does the website do? Like, what is the number one thing it does to sort of level up the process? I, th I think of the site as a reputation system. I think the current reputation system is really pushing everyone to publish in the journals, which I don't think are very efficient. And it's the, the current reputation system, it really encourages you to put stuff behind paywalls. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to build a reputation system that encourages you to share stuff openly. Hmm. And so here's the profile. So this is a guy named uh, Richard Price, yeah, and he's from the University of Oxford and yeah. philosophy. And uh, here you have um, 364,000 profile views and 31,000 document views and 2,400 followers. So right. this feels a little bit like maybe a LinkedIn or Facebook-style profile page. And you, you got some book reviews here, papers, technical documents, your thesis chapters. Well, what's the goal here? This, this didn't exist before you created it? So when I, uh, when I first had the idea, it was because yeah. I was finishing my PhD, and I thought, well, every academic needed a brand on the internet. They needed some way to collect the traffic that was coming to them and mm -hmm. looking for them. But everyone was rolling their own. They were writing their own custom HTML, and the sites weren't very... You know, literally, were, professors are putting up GeoCities pages. They were literally putting up GeoCities pages. I mean, basically. Yeah. yeah. They're putting up a Tumblr blog. And, you know, I was sort of growing up in the era of Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and thought there was just a better way to kind of create a brand online. So the, the profile page is a brand as well as those metrics re which reflect 
how how the brand's going. And so then what happens from there? I build out my profile and then I have papers and, and how does the paper process work? Because, you know, by the way, you can see it behind you here if we pull it up. So um, I can upload a paper. Is that the basic idea here? Yeah, you can upload your paper and then anyone can access it for free. So that's the kind of instant upload scenario and then the open access scenario. And then the metrics can tell you how well you're doing. So this is the metrics page, uh, the analytics page. Yeah, I see that here. And you see how many views you're getting. So you sort of, they wouldn't have this insight normally. Most academics toil under this impression that like, no one is interested in their work. That, you know, they're sort of oh. so niche, they're working on a tiny aspect of malaria or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. Right. And to be f told by the analytics page that people, there's a countries tab where you can see people from Senegal. I see that here, yeah. Panama and China and Taiwan. It's, it's, quite, it's, it's a form of self-evaluation. Now, are these all logged in users? So you know, like, hey, it's, you know, the person from, you know... Um, Russia is actually a professor. And do they do I get to like actually on LinkedIn you can sort of see who viewed my profile and say like oh wow this person in Russia is actually viewing my profile I might be able to get in touch with them. Um we display what city the visitor is coming from mm -hmm. and what country they're coming from. Right. Um but we don't display the identity of the person. Right. That'd be kind of interesting if you could opt into that because you know that's a LinkedIn what they do. Like, yeah, it's sort of like yeah. I think actually LinkedIn makes it you have to opt out of it. But that's like, right. Kind, yeah. of, kind of a creepy feature. Yeah. Um, and so what what are the results been? How long have you been at this? I mean, I know you've raised a ton of money, but yeah. What, what's actually happened since you've launched this? How long has it been in the market? So when I first launched this company, it was September '08, and back then this concept of open science, which is mm -hmm. this whole idea of reinventing the scientific mm -hmm. publishing industry in, in the light of the internet and software and so on, was a really niche idea. And over the last year, it just take, you know, some people said 2013 was the year of open science because mm. so many things happened. Governments put their weight behind it. The academic community really put their weight behind it. And academia, this site, my, my site has really sort of surfed that wave. And so now we have 7 million users and we add around 800,000 users a month. Uh, and those are registered actual registered, users. We have around 12 million monthly uniques, yeah. Well, how, how many people are out there um you know, actually publishing papers. That seems like a larger number than the people publishing papers. There or are, are you saying there are 10 million people publishing papers? There are 17 million academics in the world, so that's professors and grad students. Hmm. And then there are a bunch of people in the private sector, the Pfizer of the world, the Amgens, and the kind of private sector biotech and pharma world. Ah, so there's a certain percentage in here who are actually publishing the research and a certain one who want access to it. Yeah, that's right. So there's a news feed where you can follow the latest um, research coming out of your field and um, just new papers coming out instantly. So instead of 12-month time lag, it's more like an hour or two time lag. So if somebody publishes to Nature, can they not publish to Academia, that EDU? That's a great or question. Or do does like, or is that up to the person who owns the paper? Um, or is, or is the, are the people at Nature like, listen, if you publish it there, you can't publish it here? Yeah, it's a very vexed question. Uh, we actually got a lot of takedown notices in December from Reed Elsevier, which is the largest... Um, publisher in the world, huh. um, last, largest scientific publisher in the world. And it's, it's a somewhat complicated question. And in fact, even academics don't necessarily know which version they're allowed to share. The facts of the matter are that Elsevier and the other publishers, by and large, allow you to share what they call the final word doc of the huh. paper. But they don't allow you to share the sort of what they call the publisher PDF, which is the sort of formatted version with their logo on. It's right. quite a subtle distinction. But um, most academics actually aren't aware of the distinction. So they, and they don't really have the word doc lying around. So they just upload whatever version they have. And then sometimes we get these takedowns. And then they get extremely angry when they get told to take their paper down because their reputation is hinging on their papers being available. And so they feel right. it's not only a moral injustice for the papers to be taken off the internet, but they feel it's like a personal slight. And so they got very angry in December about these right. takedowns. And, oh, wow. So in a way, what, those, what the Reed Elseviers and those publishers are saying is, hey, we did this formatting to the paper. We own the formatting, even though you own the original. Because they're not claiming copyright over the individual's work. They're just saying, oh, we happen to format it, just like LexisNexis, where maybe some of these other folks say, hey, we took the time to scan these documents in or pick them up from the courthouse, which I guess is what they used to do. Yeah. We own that process of putting them up. You can't access our servers 
but the papers themselves are actually free. So or they're the, yours, rather, yeah, they're the I mean, individuals. They, they actually do claim copyright, and then they really? sort of give you a license to share the final text. So they sort of take the 100% copyright. And then what, what, what kind of bizarre world is academia, uh, the, the academic world that a person who spends years on a research project yeah. would then give some huge corporation the copyright to their work? And 250K. It costs around 250K per, to produce each paper in the sciences. That's right. Much, okay, so that so would be like I spend $250,000 making a documentary film, yeah. and then I go give it to Disney or Miramax or something. Yeah, it's and then maybe they let me have a couple of copies back that I could share with my friends. Right, and so a lot of academics are saying, "Hold on, if I give you this and I'm peer reviewing you for you for free, the least I should be able to do is upload this work to my to the internet, whether it's academia or my WordPress blog or somewhere else." Huh. And that's the source of the conflict: is academics saying, "Look, I don't think you're adding that much value. I think the value you're adding to the process is no longer commensurate with the prices you're charging." So mm. there's this big standoff between the authors, the artists in this industry, yeah. and their publishers. And the artists want to say, "You know, I don't get any royalty income. No one gets paid for their work, for their peer reviews, all their papers. I just want to put it up there and advance my career, advance science." So and you're in the clear if you put the word document up. Yeah, you are. I mean, the tricky thing is that for old papers, ah. you know, like five years ago. Right. You know, the Word doc is kind of lost in the you know, sort of mist of time. I mean, it's on some hard drive five computers ago. Mm. And even if they did know the subtle distinction, which honestly, most of the academics like us all, when we sign terms and conditions on yeah. websites, I mean, that's the, that's the situation. They're so desperate to get published, uh -huh. they'll sign anything. Right, I see. So they're like the jazz musicians in the 40s or 50s or 60s. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get it on a record. I don't care. Like, I can always yeah. play the song again. They have no idea how much money is being made off their backs. Yeah. But... Now, commentary in education is very specifically fair use. In fact, the fair use doctrine was designed around the concept of commentary, especially in education, is protected. That is the whole concept of fair use. So in the same way that Rap Genius is allowing people to comment on lyrics, but they do not, they were on the program, and they told me they don't, they don't pay for the lyrics. They're saying, we're commenting on the lyrics, explaining them. Therefore, it's commentary, it's fair use. Are you not, once somebody starts commenting on a paper, in the fair use clear? Um, you know, I don't know about the rap genius situation. Um, well, I do. I'm an expert on it. That's, yeah, why, I, that's why I put it out there. It's actually <laughs> fascinating to know that I didn't know that. I mean, my understanding and our understanding as a company and, and is that the... Um, the fair use doctrine might apply to like a snippet of a paper. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've heard of um, cases of publishers suing universities because the paper has been photocopied too many times. I suppose you have a class of 100 people and you mm -hmm. photocopy a paper 100 times. The university actually, there have been cases where it's been sued because the publisher said, hold on a sec, that's beyond fair use. Um, huh. So I, I think that, I mean, I think generally the end game here is when we are mo the forces in favor of open access are quite strong. Yeah. The academic community is pushing it. The governments are now saying, oh, hold on a sec, there's 250K per paper. This is, uh, this is taxpayers' money. Yeah, so you how know? is it going from the taxpayers' money? We fund it. I'm outraged right now, Richard. That we're funding right. cancer research, right. prostate cancer research. My dad's got prostate cancer. I'm going to probably forget it. Everybody in the family's got this thing. You're telling me that the government is paying for prostate cancer research, the researchers do it. They bust their ass. Then another group of people peer review it. Reed Elsevier or some other corporation gets access to it, and then nobody else can see it? Yeah, unless you pay 35 bucks um, to, to read it. Which is then holding back... But very few people have 35 bucks lying around just to of download course. one PDF. So. Yeah, to download one! From, so I mean, if you wanted to read 10, if you, let's say you're some yeah. graduate student and you say, you know, I'm thinking about going into prostate cancer because I want to, you know, like try to help Jason's dad or Jason's family yeah. or whatever, where it's got it in their genes, they're just stuck. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely... They got to they buy 10, 20 yeah. papers for $700. It's never going to happen. I mean, if you're a researcher in Africa doing genetics, I was just chatting oh, with a couple it. of researchers in Africa at the University of Nairobi, and they said, look... We just our universities can't afford it. We can't afford to subscribe, so we read the abstracts online, and they're doing genetics research and malaria research, and they can't have access to the literature. So and it's now I understand, like when, like this whole Aaron Schwartz case was around this very issue, wasn't it? His idea was that um, you know just put it all on, on the internet, and. Um, you know, I think that, like, the issue that, so, you know, the, the reason that was, like, he, he got sort of slammed by the authorities was that he, he sort of did it unilaterally. 
Um, and the reason that what's going on right now is the artists themselves are revolting. They are saying, look, I want to share this work myself. You have the funding agencies saying, I want this to be open. You have the publishers saying, hold on a sec. I mean, the, the, I think there's this general thinking in the academic community that the interests of the publishers are no longer aligned with the interests of science. And that's the sort of source of the tension. Wow. Science says, let's make it open. Publisher paywall profits say, let's lock it up. And I think the funders and the community are going to win out. It might take a two or three years, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, Obama last year had the same feeling as you just had, which is like, hold on a sec, we're putting 60 billion of US taxpayer funding into, into academic research every year. And it's then lo under lock Why isn't this on like 60 Minutes or Frontline or any of these programs? Like, shouldn't this be a massive, like, national story of like, w was it a national story that we all just missed or? Every so often you get these kind of like flashpoints. Mm. So the Aaron Swartz thing was one flashpoint. And uh, in December, there was a sort of mini issue. Um, I mean, not 60 Minutes style or CNN, but a mini issue where Reed Elsevier sent the academic community and academia a lot of takedowns and the Washington Post kind of like got involved. I think How many that, takedowns did they say? Oh, when we get back from commercial, we got to take a little quick commercial break here to talk about paying for the bills, huh? We got to pay for the bills right now. Listen, cool. when we get back, I want to know how you handled this Reed Elsevier takedown notices um, and then w when you think this is going to crack open, when we get back on, from this commercial break on This Week in Startups. Uh, yes, a month ago I was like, hmm, who is the MailChimp of video? Who is the service, software as a service that I can trust, that I can just start using today and feel like I'm going to get great service at a fair price? Well, that is Wistia. W-I-S-T-I-A. Wistia, Wistia. Oh, God, I love Wistia. It is so awesome. And you know why video is important. This is how people want to consume your product. This is how people want to get engaged. They want video. Blog posts, sure, I write blog posts. Email newsletters, great. All those things are important. But boy, is video capturing people's imagination today, and you want to be part of that. They've got over 50,000 customers over at Wistia who've been using the product uh, including MailChimp, uh, MOZ, uh, Moz, Blank Label, Twist, a bunch of people use it. And they have the most amazing, amazing um, metrics. And I love metrics. And I can see, oh, wow, this person watched. The, what the heck is this person doing uh, in Edmonton just jumping around this video promo and looking for stuff? Or how come this person left the uh, Stuart Alsop video so early? How come this person watched it twice? It's incredible. The... The level of detail we get on our video today, understanding our customers when they're dropping out of video, when they're w doubling down and watching something two or three times is incredible. And uh, we love it. It's a great product. And they'll also capture emails. Uh, you guys may have seen that when you're at thisweekinstartups.com. You'll see when we uh, put up email, put up videos now, we say, hey, join the mailing list. Put your email in. And every week, a couple dozen people come in. And that is gold for us. So get your free Wistia account today at wistia.com slash twist. Wistia.com slash twist. First five videos free. No credit card required. A great company. Get in there. Wistia.com slash twist. And uh, you'll love it. Let's get back to the program. All right, everybody. I'm out. Once again, producer Gina has brought me a guest who's got me outraged. I'm like, I'm outraged on like 10 levels right now. I get outraged pretty easily, Richard. But uh, my guest, Richard Price, is running the uh, fabulousacademia.edu, trying to crack, crack this Gestapo, which wants to like keep all this academic research behind paywalls. It makes no sense for society. When we talk about this, you're talking about science is... Uh, you know, wants everything to be free, so it advances, and then these corporate, you know, folks want to make money off of it. But in the long term, I mean, society is really net net losing. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, w I mean, there are so many companies, obviously, where the, their profits, like Google or Amazon, are aligned with the interests of their consumers by and large. And I think the academic community felt that for, for hundreds of years, actually, journal publishing was, they considered it very valuable because it really added a lot of, uh, uh, you know, provided a great service. And now distribution is free because of the internet. Mm. Um, and matching with peer reviewers is much lower cost. And sort of formatting was used to be a big job when a publisher would get like a handwritten letter. Mm. And they'd have to, the production would be a legitimate cost. Now everyone just like, as we know from the web, you just format stuff yourself. Mm. Um, you know, WordPress, you know, formatting is just done by CSS. And you don't yeah, need the whole idea that formatting and like, it's not like they've got like, yeah, letter presses and they're putting right. the letters in, you know, right. H and then, you know, running a, right. uh, a, you know, thing. So is there a market for like, you know, the way BitTorrent exists for like illegal copies of stuff? Is there like some Russian group that has taken all the academic papers and puts them on for free on the web? Is this like, an, is there an underground in papers or no? 
It's a good question. I don't know for sure. Yeah. Um, if you look at chillingeffects.org, yeah. where they look at sort of the takedown activity of the big publishers, there definitely are some PDFs on those sorts of yeah. sites that, they, that get DMCAs. I think that the, that like the broad population needs to just to be able to access these papers really easily. Like when you type yeah. into Google, it needs to be just right there in a f super legitimate way. I know because I, when I was researching cancer and some of these things, I would try and I'm trying to figure out how to just find the papers because I see a paper referenced, and you go on this crazy like Google journey and you can never get there. Yeah. But you find like an abstract or you get a page. Yeah. I mean, it's incredibly annoying. You re really want to like, like Wikipedia where there's, when there's a link. Hmm. You know, you just click on the link and you find the paper. How many takedown notices did you get in this latest uh, flurry? So we got 2,800. So 2,800? 2,800 papers that got taken off. And, the, and Harvard received them and a bunch of universities also received them. So it wasn't just academia that was targeted. It was a kind of internet-wide strategy. And one thing that was such a explo so explosive was the fact that for 20 years, these publishers have basically turned a blind eye. They've said, you know right. what? Because they the, know they're in the wrong. The official rules are this Word doc versus published PDF, but honestly, we don't really care. We're not going to crack yeah. down on it. Suddenly, something happened in mid-2013. Who knows what it was? There's a lot of open science momentum. Maybe it was that. Yeah. That made them say, hold on a sec. It's, it's gone too far. Time to start cracking down on all this, all this sort of like what they regard as mm. illegitimate, illegitimate sharing by the author. Um, now, do you have an annotation tool? In, That's in a great question, actually. This is coming back to Rap Genius. Yeah. So, I think actually earlier on you asked a question about like, uh, you know, how does quality and rigor and peer review look in the future? Right. And we're working actually on it in line, this sort of idea that's like scrutinizing and dissecting the paper line by line. That's, mm -hmm. that's with a community behind it and a reputation system behind it. That's something we're working on right now. And we don't have it yet, but it's, right. it's coming. Let me tell you something. This is what I would do. I'm, from, I'm not from Oxford. I'm from Brooklyn. But here's how I would handle it. You, what's the biggest paper of like the last couple of years that has the most onerous, crazy publisher who would defend it to their dying breath? Which paper is it? Uh -huh. Who's the most litigious? Is it Reed? Yeah, Reed Elsevier. For, so for Reed sure. Elsevier. And it what's would have to be one of their papers. What would be their top pub? I like actually, a top pa or top paper of last year. Or I mean, two. some probably probably from one of their top journals, like the Lancet or something. They're probably most protective of their what they could regard as the premium. Great. So you just take the premium's biggest story of the year, the biggest you know, paper of the year. And you put it up and you say, we're doing a fair use, you know, rigorous review of this with a thousand people. The paper is you can only view, you know, whatever paragraph that you want to or page that you want to comment on. But mm. go ahead and put a comment. Yeah. And you do an act of civil disobedience where you do a sit in, a fair use sit in. Yeah. <laughs> and you just email a thousand and say, if you believe that these papers should be open and free, all you have to do is put a comment on something here and it will be free. Because it will be. Yeah. You'll win. And you got $20 million in the bank, right? You raised 20 million bucks, so you should be able to fight the storm. Yeah. I mean, I think what we're trying to do as a company is, um, I mean, we have 20 million bucks, it's true, but that's, that, that's sort of dwarfed by the resources of these larger publishers. And they so we can't win. We don't want to get in, stuck EFF in two. Would, yeah, the EFF would back you, though, on this one. It's an interesting point. What so is the EFF's position on this? They must have a position. I actually don't know the EFF. I mean, I suspect, you know, like, they would be following the lines of Aaron Swartz and so on. The idea of openness is always good. I'm, right, I'm yeah. pretty sure. And definitely they're super, super pro-fair use. I mean, literally, you know, if you look at that fair use doctrine, if it was just, if there's no commercial interest there, so as long as you don't put ads on the page or you're not charging in some way, then I think you're in the clear. But which leads to... What, do you, what is your business model then? I well, mean, okay, so that's a great point yeah. because it also comes back to this idea of annotation and scrutiny and, you know, what do academics want? So one of the issues right now is that Amgen is this huge pharmaceutical company in 2011. They produced this report saying, look, there's this much vaunted process of peer review. Everyone's supposed to think that's really a great process. Like, right. uh, you know, the Newton quote, I, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. The idea of peer review is supposed to put a stamp on a paper and say, guys, Whatever you, th whatever you think this paper is good on or not, it's at least validated. You can now rely on it. You don't have to do the research yourself. Right. It's moved it's a the ball forward result. a little bit, yeah. And Amgen said, look, this narrative is completely wrong. It turns out that they took a 53 landmark oncology papers um, in top journals, and they found that 89% of them were not reproducible in a way that could drive a drug discovery program. Wow. So the peer review stamp was just simply inaccurate 90% of the time. And I think part of this, well, I mean, so that's, I think that's a big problem to be solved, is fixing peer review. Hmm. And so, 
in your world, peer review gets fixed by having more people available and able to make a living from peer review? I think that's basically it, actually. Yeah. Having more eyeballs on the problem and having your reputation attached to your comments. Mm. So if you tear a paper apart and you, you, you find the objection, right. you should get credit from that. The community should be able ah. to bestow reputation on you to say, hey, that's a great point. And then the hiring committees and so on that people live and die by will say, well, Jason's contribution to science is measured by the papers he's published, by the, the, the commentary, the incisive commentary that he's made on these other papers, and the sort of constellation of different kinds of, of impact. All right, because some people may not actually make their bones, as it were, writing the paper, but pointing out, hey, listen, you did a great job on your, your research there, pal, and the paper's great, but here's a fundamental flaw. You need to maybe think about these three issues in the next, you know, yeah. paper. Yeah, I mean, and the numbers are really important because if you have, let's say, the breast cancer community, like 50,000 scientists in the, in the, around mm. the world, and the idea of peer review is basically a prediction market. It's an attempt to say, like, predict that this paper is going to be reproducible. But if you only have two or three people in the sample size, which is the number of peer reviewers right now, mm. it's not really statistically significant. I mean, you can't really, like, extrapolate much from what two or three people think. But a larger sample size, let's say if you had 1,000 people in mm. peer reviewing a paper, then you get more s significant results. So is your business model eventually going to be that those peer reviewers would be higher through your site and then they could make a living getting whatever, 500? You could hire 10 people for 500 bucks each to... You know, who are really good in breast cancer to peer review other papers? We would like to be able to solve the peer review problem for Amgen. We'd like yeah. to be able to say to Amgen, look, right now you're getting a stream of published papers, mm. peer reviewed papers, of which 90%. It, I mean, it costs them a lot, by the way. It costs them one to five million dollars to reproduce a paper, and then it fails 90% huh. of the time. So what we want to be able to do is say, hey, look, here is a kind of like community vetted stream mm. of Alzheimer's work where reproducibility is guaranteed. It's 100% accurate huh. and, um, and charge for that, that sort of. So I guess the way I see it is like you've got the kind of future of open access in science where you've got the papers are accessible for free. The comments as well are accessible for free. And I think there'll be kind of, kind of some kind of like NLP layer or service layer on top of that, mm. which tries to say, OK, of all this like data that's out there, it's trying to create some sort of like, you know, signal from the noise about like which. So it would be like a service that would be layered on top of this. Which in a way is, do you see this analogous to what happened in open source where like it used to be you paid for the software, you know, and then somebody installed and you paid a little bit for that, but then it became like the software is free, but hey, you're going to need to hire developers to really customize this and make it work for you? I think so. And I think at some point, I mean, I think that access used to be expensive and production used to be expensive, but now that's been commoditized. I think peer review is going to get commoditized. And it may be that the service layer as well gets commoditized, which would be great because then you could just make even more of it sort of freely accessible. How, how is the pace of innovation in the world, when you look at it in the world, in your opinion, you know, being driven by companies versus academia? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, this really gets to the heart of this Amgen stuff, yeah. because the whole narrative of the 60 billion, the whole reason Congress approves the 60 billion a year into academic science is the idea that, like, the taxpayer gets, the, gets some value back. And the basic flow is, you, for your 60 billion a year, you get two million papers published in the academic ecosystem. Those papers are read by the pharma companies, the R&D companies, the SpaceXs of the world, the Tesla, right. anyone doing R&D. And some of them make their way into products. Hmm. And Amgen's sitting there saying, this is just ridiculous because 90% of this stuff is actually not reproducible. Hmm. And that whole pipeline is in question. It's $200 per American to fund this. You know, about 317 million Americans, so just call it 300. Yeah. You said 60 billion, so yeah. that's, yeah. Is that worth it? Or are we overspending, underspending on those grants? Is that the best way to deploy that capital? Um, it, I mean, it, the thing about academic science is that it's, the investment is so long term. Mm -hmm. You know, private capital wants a return in like 10 years max, right. you know, and, and I think that, you know, but a government will take a view that like grandchildren are important. You, know, you should invest right. in the future and um, and, and, and so I think, you know, the, it, it, it's very much based on the idea that products will come out of it. Mm. And, you know, I think that um, if you did the sort of, uh, you know, genie, I mean, right now, interestingly enough, like pharma, there's a bit of a crisis in the patent sort of pipeline of pharma because the R&D departments within pharma are not doing very well and not actually generating much innovation. Mm. And... So they're looking, where are, the, where are the ideas for the new drugs coming from? Well, not really from farm, farm R&D. If you talk to a farmer exec, they'll say, it really comes from biotech companies, mm. these new sort of cool startups. 
um, and then, but also from academic science. Um, so it's, um, it's, a, it's, I think the academic literature is, is really important. What about crowdfunding um, as a device here? Because we do see, you know, ideas that maybe Apple or Google or Miramax or NBC don't want to pursue. And then Kickstarter comes up and, you know, at the same time frame as your startup, you must be thinking like, wow, look over there. There's a group of people who want to fund things to exist in the world. And these mm. people over here need funding and they go for grants. And those people used to go for grants and or venture capital, angel investing, a studio, angel investors, whatever it is. Has that happened yet where crowdfunding sites have started addressing academic research? Do you think there's potential there? Because they are going out and building a pitch anyway and pitching who, NIH or somebody? That's right. I mean, the, you know, scientists spend so much of the time pitching the NIH, exactly. Yeah. And so the, then they just build a website that says, like, hey, this is what I'm pitching the NIH. Here's yeah. my video. Here's why it's important. And then would anybody else like to give some money? Yeah. They wouldn't even be allowed, would they? I think it will happen. I mean, one is people who succeed on Kickstarter are often real hustlers. Like mm. you have to sort of hustle your way to sure. and market Good yourself. Good marketers, hustlers. Academics yeah. tend to be kind of more like shrinking violets as well, like yeah. less, you know, less self-emotional. So that's one issue that we need to get around. But they do apply for grants. I mean, they understand the rat race. So they right. are capable of, of getting out there. I think a second thing is if you're, let's suppose, interested in supporting Alzheimer's research and you give money to the you know, American Alzheimer's Association or something like that, um, you know, you have a sort of confidence that they'll distribute it well. Whereas no, uh, if you just like find a, a researcher at the University right. of Florida, now the University of Florida may in fact have the best outside department right. in the world. But as an outsider, it's hard to evaluate right now. Right. It's so technical. So maybe those nonprofits in between are actually doing a pretty good function of distributing that money yeah. to people who they think deserve it. I think if one could produce some kind of a layer of metrics, so you can sort of give, like someone, some, let's say you've got a, like a, a mother living in Montana who mm. wants to support Alzheimer's research. If there was some way to make her super confident about where she's going to put her thousand bucks in a yeah. way that will, like, will actually like deliver some de decent value, she would need some guidance. So like met, perhaps a website that had a reputation system yeah, and profiles? I mean, yeah, that, 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 that's um, one, that was something we thought of. <laughs> so you've thought of crowdfunding. You've thought about individual, like donating to individual professors. Because, you know, when you get down to brass tacks, the person who controls the purse springs and is able to distribute the money and or traffic or attention becomes a powerful person in the ecosystem. That seems to be you. Yeah. Or I, becoming you. I think the reputation layer is really critical, like helping people be comfortable. The reason the American Cancer Society gets something like $800 million a year in, in funding from the public is that people trust how it disperses its funding. I just saw this um, incredible documentary, um, How to Survive a Plague, about sort of the AIDS crisis in the 80s and just how slow things were going at, mm. you know, NIH and, you know, everything in the United States here. Um, does the United States move too slow compared to other countries? I mean, wh how is the United States doing in terms of being competitive with approvals of drugs and or just papers? Are other countries, because we hear like, eh, the United States isn't keeping up with these other countries. Are they really outpacing us or not? I mean, we know on education levels, we can see that like, you know, whatever, sixth graders. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in the area you're an expert, which is yeah. in academia. The open so the last, in 2013, um, two governments, the U.S. government and the U.K. government, signed into le passed some legislation that was super open access friendly. So they, both Obama and David Cameron in the U.K. said, "Look, they had the same sort of feeling that you had, which was this has just got to change." Yeah. And so Obama said, "Look, from now on, um, of the 60 billion that we fund every year in academic research, 30 billion of that." And all the papers that emerge from about half of that have to be open access within Ooh, wow. 12 months of publication. So you put an open, open access mandate. Now, it hasn't actually like been implemented yet. It's still mm. just like it's been signed into law. And the UK government says something di slightly different. They will say, they said, OK, if it costs 4K to make the paper open, we're just going to pay for that. We're going to insist that any government, any UK funded research, we are just going to cover the 4K to make it open. Oh, wow. So we're going to give you a $250,000 grant. You can be sure that you've got a grant for 246000 now. Right. And that 4K is going to read Elsevier That's forever. Kind of, I think it's, more, it's, it's probably something like, two, you know, you, you've got 249 and maybe we'll give you a little bit extra. Yeah, something like Small that. amount extra. So, you know, the grants have been cut a little bit. You, you were able to raise money from uh, Kosla and Spark and True and everything. Yeah. When you come to venture capitalists 
and angel investors, et cetera, with an idea around, you know, education, academia, like this is a, was it hard? Were they like skeptical as to where this would go? What I found was that um, I really had to zoom out, you know, to explain the mission. Like, what is the narrative of science? Why does science matter? You know, you ask, like, where does academic literature f fit in? Well, probably that, like, you know, a if we do find manage to cure Alzheimer's, it's yeah. probably going to come from a – well, it's certainly come from a scientist somewhere, wherever you know, they might be employed by Pfizer or some biotech company or Harvard right. or whatever. But it's going to come from science. And zooming out and saying, look, here is the flow of money – um, it's really, there's a lot of money going into academic research worldwide. Here's the narrative of how ideas get translated into products. Looking at that macro level, now zooming in, if we wanted to speed up the cure for Alzheimer's or the, I don't know, finding a sustainable non-fossil fuel mm. kind of energy, are there inefficiencies in the process whereby an idea makes its way into a product that we could smooth out? And then sort of explaining academia.edu in terms of that big picture, yeah. that was the thing that like made a huge difference. And the money is typically from the government and then to a lesser extent from these nonprofits. It's, yeah, overwhelmingly from the government um, and sometimes from large foundations like the Gates Foundation. Uh, and, oh, that's interesting with the Gates Foundation. Have they been actually making an impact, do you think, in terms of research and academia? Or I mean, we obviously see them in the field having tremendous impact, but I don't think many people, including myself, are very aware of what they're doing in academia and research. Yeah, the health division um, has been investing massively in malaria hmm. and um, in malaria research. Um, cause so not just sending out the tents and vaccinations, which right. you hear about a lot. Right, it's actually the Gates, core research. You know. A lot of researchers have malaria grants. Really? And the reason is that, that basically Bill Gates and Melinda Gates said Pfizer is just not motivated hmm. to build a malaria vaccine. Vaccine, It's just not worth it for them. And so you've got a mil billions of people who are potentially at risk from malaria and would benefit from a vaccine. Right, they just don't, don't have the money. To don't pay. have the economic wherewithal to justify the R&D. So he said, well, I'll do it. I'll be the R&D. Wow. I'll pay for that. And, and what, to what scale, I mean, versus the government? I mean, um, hundreds of millions of dollars? I think it's hundreds of millions. Yeah. You know, I think they disperse generally at maybe $2 billion a year at the Gates Foundation. And I think maybe like a third of it is health. Huh. Um, and then, but the, U, the U.S. government has like, the NIH spends around uh, $30 billion a year on, on biomedical stuff. Education seems to be one of these areas, you know, stepping back to the, where these people are employed, you know, teaching that seems to be very broken. I mean, what impact does that have on your business? The fact that, hey, the number of people going to these colleges and the amount they're paying could be at risk. I mean, it, it seems unsustainable how much tuitions are costing here in the United States. A yeah. lot of people are starting to think like, well, maybe I just don't need to go to college. It's not worth being 200000 in debt, 100000 in debt. We're hearing that over and over again. That system's broken. How does that impact the fact that those are the people who actually write your papers? Yeah. Um, Has so it started in to yet? In the case of a scientist, um, like a hard scientist, like yeah. biology or physics or something, the majority of their funding actually comes from the government. Because if you get tenure, yeah. cause a lot of people talk about tenure, but the reality is for a scientist, tenure doesn't matter very much. Because if you have tenure and you have your 120K a year job, the fact is you can't do any science without a grant. Like You need to raise like a million dollars from NEH just to do a few experiments. So you're all, your real funding comes from, from the government. How, where do we stand versus the other governments in terms of investment in funding? Um, I, it's a good question, like per capita. I mean, I certainly would be the, the highest by far in yeah. terms of aggregate. Um, I suspect per capita it's somewhat equal with Europe. Maybe it's a little bit more. I yeah. mean, certainly the US that is... that brain project going on. I don't know if you heard about that one, mapping yeah. the brain and trying yeah. to... Yeah, it was like 100 million bucks from Obama, I think. Yeah. Um, it's a I, couple of billion dollar project, though, in total in Europe to figure out how the brain works. Yeah. I mean, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, there are so many people suffering and at risk from Alzheimer's. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's just an insane percentage. Is this becoming a consumer pheno phenomenon as well? I mean, obviously, like Edge.org and Brockman stuff and reading a lot of those authors, like it seems like a lot of them have become rock stars. I mean, the whole TED franchise for... Right. Decades now has been based upon John Brockman's clients who go there and give, you know, you know, whoever it happens to be, Daniel Dennett or, right. you know, Brian Green or Lisa Randall or whoever. Yeah. Daniel Dennett. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, good. All these incredible people going there. Yeah. Um, it, is it becoming, are they becoming like pop stars? And is, does that mean like you see consumers wanting to go in here and follow scientists? 
follow researchers, follow projects while they're occurring? Do you see a day when that happens? I definitely see a day where, you know, because all the papers are available, you find people who are just naturally drawn to reading papers and you find someone who's, you know, a budding genius. And there's a cool story last year of this budding genius guy called Jack and Draker from Maryland, who was like 50 and his dad, his uncle, or some close family friend, I think he calls him his uncle, died of pancreatic cancer. So he started to read about pancreatic cancer. Hmm. And his parents were like affluent enough to pay for the $35 fees. I mean, like mm -hmm. it was expensive, but still, I mean, they see he begged them. Mm. Um, he initially would like, you know, email the authors and say, can you send me the papers? And sometimes they'd say, no, I don't own the copyright. I can't even email you the paper. Ah. It's that kind of nuts. Anyway, he actually found a new test for pancreatic cancer. Mm. Um, so he was an outsider to, the f to, to science. He started, he had an emotional connection with pancreatic cancer, and he said, well, I'm gonna read about it. It's a bit like Lorenzo's oil, you know, I'm gonna personally get involved in reading about this stuff. And then you're so invested in it, you right. start thinking of fresh ideas. And then if you could actually, like, this is one of the things I like about your system, it reminds me in a way, the, the, the profile page is a very powerful thing. And I recently had Hand Up, uh, a nonprofit on the program, and they make a profile page for another group of people who, are not very high profile, the homeless. And so a homeless person huh. has a profile page okay. with their video and how they're trying to get their lives back together. That's and cool. it becomes incredibly compelling to look at a person's, you know, landing page on the internet, their profile of their aspirations and where they're going. And they get followers. The followers then, you know, wind up donating money on a reoccurring basis wow. to try to help them Genius. exist in the world, <laughs> right? It's, it's kind of like you're doing the same thing here, which is, you know, they, these a lot of these academics, if you're not in that top TED you know, yeah. Lisa Randall group, yeah. you're going to wind up here and maybe get all these followers. And then maybe you get a bunch of young people following you who are enthusiastic, who want to work on your projects. I mean, yeah. it could be, has it, have there been transformative stories like that where people were discovered as it were on yeah. academia? It's all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, you know, sometimes you get a case of like an academic being contacted by, so like a couple of months ago, uh, we, we ran a story on our blog where someone got contacted by a director in New York saying he was doing a documentary on Bruce Lee and he'd read this guy's papers. He was actually like a media professor from Wales in the UK. And he flew the guy out to, he just said, I found you in academia, so you seem really interesting, come out to be in the documentary. About Bruce Lee? It was about Bruce Lee, yeah. I mean, it was kind of, it's, it's all kind of, there were just these crazy stories where, um, people get together for all, all kinds of interesting reasons. What percentage of the authors who are active today do you have in the system? Do you think? Um, so we think there are about se you know se a universe of 17 million academics in the world, and we mm -hmm. have seven million uh, registered users. I mean, yeah. And some I mean, percentage are them. Some percentage, yeah. I mean, I, it's pro the the way the profiles, the registered users, and the unique split up. We have like seven million users and about 12 million month unique. So the right. uniques are just readers. Right. Um, from all over the world, reading the paper for whatever reason. The reason you sign up to create a profile, by and large, is to have a brand. Right. You know, to be a researcher, to say, this is me. And this, so, um, that's, You're getting there. Yeah, exactly. I'm making progress. Can you just make profiles for people who have written papers, like as landing pages, so they have like a starting point? Like, it yeah. would seem like a lot of directories take that approach, right? If you're a public figure, yeah. you know, you could actually start building the profile as it were, and then they could claim it the same way LinkedIn makes a profile for Apple computers based on five or six people, you know, saying they work there. And then Apple comes in and claims it eventually to clean it up. Yeah. It's, it's uh, something we, we once tried when we just started in like 08 and 09, yeah. early 09. And we, we didn't do it that well. Like we did too many of those sort of like ghostish profiles. Yeah. And the academics and, were like, why did you put this profile up of me? <laughs> well, it was more just like the sort of sense of community being a live uh, environment. Because one of the facts right now, the consistent ethos in the site is every time you see a paper, you can click on the, the guy, the author and follow him or her. Mm. And it's a living person. It's not dead. So we don't even do like Newton profiles or Einstein profiles. Right. Everything is a living person. Mm. And we're, we're, you know, it's, that does mean that we, um, don't have some of these older profiles. Hmm. But at, at the moment, that vibrancy, we feel it's an important aspect of the site. All right, well, listen, I, I wish you the best on this. I'm, it's kind of outrageous that this hasn't happened fast enough, but I'm, it's kind of nice that Obama's saying, like, at least half this stuff that's, you know, over some period of time. But you're, you're in the same situation I was in with the SEC, which is crowdfunding gets approved, and then the SEC's taking years to figure it out. And he said it's got to be done in a year. And you right. know what the SEC says? 
What? We'll get we'll get to it. Okay. <laughs> the president says you have one year to comply, and yeah. the SEC is like, okay, it's eighteen yeah. months. I think we're right there. Actually, we're in the same sort of gray zone. They don't they, they don't feel the that they have to comply. Yeah. I think. Yeah. In some cases, like okay, you police it then, but you could yeah. start going out there and ripping these papers. I really think you got to just like the whole history of papers has to be just taking a rap genius approach. Yeah. Anyway, listen, we're all going to be watching <laughs> uh, academia.edu. I hope that you just like totally take these guys to the mat and, and make all this stuff open. And they got to just figure out a better model. I think you probably have a better model with having people pay, uh, for like the peer reviews or something like that. That would be incredible yeah. if those people became like free agents who like, these seven people will just rip your paper apart, boom, and you can, you can get them involved early. Yeah, right. And hire them as consultants. Yeah. Like a go to workforce. Yeah. Yeah, that's the goal. Get every single science PDF ever written on the internet available for free and peer reviewed line by line. Genius. All right, listen, everybody, uh, Richard, uh, you can follow at Richard Price uh, 100, Richard Price 100. Uh, and Academia, of course, you can follow and uh, come to the Lunch Festival February 24th, 25th, and 26th and visit academia.edu. I'm at Jason. Thanks, uh, producer Gina. Thanks, producer Brandis. Thanks, Demont and Luke and everybody. Uh, go check out my latest project, inside.com, and we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. <laughs>